But I go, can I just try another one? That moment comes and I just go, this is Sparta! And kick the guy, and I turn around, and all my army are literally like this. The Phantom of the Opera. I was very surprised that I was picked for that role because I used to sing in a rock band. When I was a law student, Joe Schumacher called my um, agent and said, can Jerry sing? My agent said, yeah, he can sing, but I don't know if he can sing that. So it went from me going for my first ever singing lesson and singing to um, the professor of music from Royal Academy of Music in London. And I said, look, just tell me, am I wasting my time? I don't want to make a fool of myself. And we finished and she said, you can absolutely do this. You need to put in a lot of work, you need to learn the rules, but you can do this, you know, so that's all I needed to hear. For one purpose and one alone Since the moment I first heard you sing I have needed you with me to serve me to sing There were so many times I'd just be sitting there going, how the hell did I get here? This is awesome. I can't even sing. <laughs> I love the opportunity to try different things and, and hopefully surprise people and maybe prove them wrong. So sometimes when people have a lot to say, you go, okay, well, it just kind of ups the ante in a way. 300, I wanted that role so badly. And I remember being told by the producers, we want you, but we're scared to go to Alan Horn, who's the president of Warner Brothers, just in case he doesn't want you. And then it's gonna hurt our movie, we're gonna look stupid. So we know you know Alan, by the way, through the Phantom of the Opera, so why don't you call him? And I called him, I was outside Kings Road Cafe, and I said, Alan, hey, it's Jerry Butler. He said, how are you, Jerry? I know why you're calling, and let me tell you, there's a process and you have to be nominated by them. And I wanted to say, I have been. They're the ones that told me to call you. But I didn't say that, but I pushed. And it's these little moments in your life that make all the difference. But I said, I know, but. And he said, I'll tell you what, come in for a coffee. And I went for a coffee and I had my whole speech prepared saying, everything I've done in my life has led to this moment to play this man. And I promise you, if you give me this chance, I will not let you down. And he did give me the chance. And the rest of it was me trying to hold up my end of the bargain. Take on this character, do Leonidas proud, do the Spartans proud, do Alan Horn proud. It led me to this incredibly tunnel visioned kind of preparation and focus just die hard. I, I, I trained every hour I could. Sounds weird, but I would literally channel Leonidas. I would almost do these meditations where I would feel him coming into me through time, through some kind of weird portal, like just coming into my body. And then I kind of felt if he's in me, then I'm just trusting that this is transmitting. Well, that's an easy choice for us, Arcadian. Spartans never retreat. Spartans never surrender. There's a big um, fight sequence when I had rehearsed this for months. I know on the day we were doing it, it was the first big action sequence we were shooting in the movie. And there was a camera rig that had three different cameras that had never been used before. Something was not going right. So it was one o'clock in the afternoon and we hadn't shot anything. They basically said to my stunt double, you get up and get ready to go because we don't have time for failure. And it was killing me. I'm like, I've done all this. I've trained and trained and trained. And this is my big moment. And I wanted to scream and shout, but I didn't. And Tim Connolly, my, my stunt double, who's also my father to the young me in the movie, he could see, and he's like, look, I tell you, he says, I don't want to do this either. I want you to do this. He said, so get up and just start practicing with me, just so the director can see you kind of, you're good at this. So I get up and I'm m m doing my moves and I see Zach looking over and then I see him speak to somebody and they go, okay, let's try one. Jerry, why don't you try it? And I did it and it was amazing. And I finished. Maybe the biggest buzz I ever had in my career is when I finish and I put the sword through the guy and I'm like, bah, like this. And I look up and everybody's standing back. The whole crew, they're like, whoa, and it just exploded. And all the stuntmen jumped up. Everybody exploded. This is Sparta which has obviously become quite an iconic line. I had done quite a few takes and most of them were, this is Sparta. And it's part process and part insecurity maybe, but I go, can I just try another one? And he goes, okay, okay, go, go, go for it. 
And that moment comes and I just go, this is Sparta! And kick the guy. And I turn around and all my army are literally like this. And I go up to Zach and I go, that was too much. That was too much. He goes, yeah, but it was awesome. This is Sparta! How to train your dragon? How to Train Your Dragon was surprisingly one of the most special experiences I ever had. It was just fun to go in and play this big, loud, ignorant Viking who just surprises people with the heart. They had cameras everywhere, and I remember thinking, why you got cameras, you know, it's just my voice. And then my main animator, his name was Christoph, one day showed me how they animate it. So there's a theme where I'm kind of saying, well, I thought it was over, but there you are. Thank you, God. And yet, I, didn't, I didn't realize I was moving so much, but that was me doing all of this. And then you see me in the movie and it's literally animated just like I was there. God, I almost gave up on you, but here we are. And that ties you into something so much, you know, you realize, okay, it's not just my voice. There's a bit more that I'm, that I'm giving to that. He could crush mountains, level forests, tame seas. Even as a boy, I knew what I was, what I had to become. Hiccup is not that boy. And it's very funny because nowadays people introduce, you know, they say to their kids, this is story from How to Train Your Dragon. And you see the kids like this. And then I go, Hey, how are you? We're gonna go and chase dragons. And now, ha! Like this, it's so, it's so awesome. I love it. Den of Thieves. I read Den of Thieves back in 2012 and it was one of my favorite scripts. They were so clever, but we couldn't get it made. It was a very hard movie to get made because it wasn't cheap and Christian had never directed anything before. There often came these conversations, which were, maybe it's time to move on. By this point, I'd become very close with Christian, and I also loved this movie. Finally, we pulled the money together, and then we're, we're making the movie, but I felt this big pressure, because for years, I used to have dinners and lunches with Christian, and he would talk about big news, big Nick's this, big Nick's this, big Nick's this, and then we go to start the movie, and I'm like, Shit, he's told me a lot about Big Nick. I hope I remember it, I hope, like, who is Big Nick? And one time we're at a restaurant, and it's like a Benny Han or something, there's a plate, which I think is sushi. And while he's talking, I'm like this, I'm tuna going, this is really chewy sushi, but I'm like, right, right, oh, this is how Big Nick went, and, and you're talking about Big Nick. I finished the plate and he's like, by the way, that's raw chicken. And that was basically Big Nick. <laughs> I'm like, well, let me ask you this, okay. Do we look like the types who'll arrest you, put you in handcuffs, drag you down to the station? Hmm? I'm asking you a question. No. Not at all. Right. We just shoot you. And it was also the best time I had with other actors. We're all still great friends. In all my movies, I've never had so much love for the people that I worked with. And, uh, you know, we really tried to keep that, or lack of bond. Yes, I love you. Yeah, I play a guy called Jerry, so already it was a good start. Jerry Kennedy, who is, to a lot of people, a lot of women, that perfect guy, great sense of humor, loves the crap out of his wife. I said, you know what, in this movie, I'm not gonna think about, like, like Jerry does, I'm not gonna think about myself, I'm gonna think about everybody else. And it was amazing how incredible that was, it took me out my own head. And that, to be honest, was the story of that movie. Everybody was making it for the right reasons. And everybody had their own personal story. It was Richard, it was his best friend who died of a heart attack, um, who was a director. And then to the producer, Molly, her sister who died of cancer. and. You know, this was her story. Was a, and that was about 10 times through this movie. It was their own personal stories. I know what I want because I have it in my hands right now. Do you, do you know what you want? Because you better tell me now if I'm not it. One, to work with Hilary Swank, who's incredible. And for me to get a chance to, because I, I so often play Americans. To me, the Scots and the Irish are so similar. My whole family's, most of my family are Irish. To have a chance to bring on that kind of Irish character in such a well-written script was just, I mean, I mean, I really had such a great time filming that movie. Even today, people come and they go, oh my God, this is my favorite movie. They start, people often start crying as they tell me about how much they cried during that movie. You know, beautifully written and beautifully directed by Richard. Law-abiding citizen. 
That's the first movie that I produced. But I was always playing the other role. I was playing the hero, the cop. But I kept saying, I kind of want to play this guy. But all my guys kept saying, no, no, just stick to the hero, stick to the hero. And we were trying to find somebody to play Clyde Shelton. And we offered it to Jamie Foxx. And Jamie, being the cocky that he is, said, no, don't want to play Clyde Shelton, but I'll play his role. We were all on the call. Jamie wasn't on the call, but all the producers. And I said, okay, let's do it. So basically we swapped roles and I'm so glad, I, can, I now can't imagine that movie any other way. Counselor, you might want to cancel your 12.30 lunch with Judge Roberts. Excuse me? In fact, you might want to cancel the rest of the week because you're going to be busy. Sit down. I always felt there came a certain point in the movie where the audience would turn against Clyde when he starts killing innocent people. But it was amazing. The vengeance that were in an audience who were like, no, he was so badly wronged. And because you did feel his humanity and because Jamie did push it in the other direction, it was amazing how far my character could go. And people still want him to win and want him to get away with it. That's not how I imagined it, but I kind of loved that that's how it turned out. And it, but it was an interesting, um, psychological study on humanity as a whole. The Ugly Truth. I was making a movie called Gamer. Every night at dinner, we'd all be having dinner, and I'd tell, I have perhaps 150,000 jokes. I grew up in that culture, and I still write them down. So I'd tell jokes, 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 and then Tom and Gary would go, Ugly Truth. And, I, and I'm like, what is Ugly Truth? And they kept going, Ugly Truth, and winking. And I'm thinking, what is Ugly Truth? And I was assuming that it was some movie like Gamer. And then they sent me the script. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I'm gonna get to say this. I had the role, but I says, can I audition for this role in an American accent? So I went in and I did three of my biggest scenes in an American accent. And they went, yeah, you're American. Suddenly I'm working with Katie Heigl. I was madly in love with Katie Heigl and she just made her movie with Seth Rogen, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. But now we're on set together. And I'm like, how, how is this happening? If you want it to work out with this guy, then you'll listen to me and you'll do exactly as I say. You've probably already done irreparable damage with your psycho-aggressive control freak phone call. It might even be too late. And if you do salvage the situation, you'll never be more than Abby, his desperate neighbor. Oh, that's such a blast making that, playing that guy. It's just fun. Olympus has fallen. Antoine and I had been working on a lot of different projects and I took it to him and said, what about this? Thinking he'd say no, but he's like, you know what? This is fun, let's, let's do this. I love developing scripts and he loves making movies <laughs> and he shot the hell out of this. And, but even then I wasn't sure, I don't know how this is gonna turn out and it just turned out in terms of the ultimate popcorn movie, you know, super fun, in your face, inspiring, you know, he heroic. London has fallen. For every movie, we try to find a different take. So London, we made it more international. Don't want to get team to port on me now. You okay? Yeah. yeah. Stay with me. Yeah. We'll get you out of here. No! We could be bringing in the Japanese, the Canadians, the but again, finding a way, how do you make a city unworkable? Not just an area, but create a situation where in a whole city, nobody can move. And you gotta get a president out of there and he's like a hunted animal. Angel has fallen. And then in this one, we've gone in a completely different direction because you thought, well, it can't really be a city or a White House. So we turned it in on it in itself and made it about the very man who's gone through all this. I feel like you get to know him just like I've gotten to know him more. You get to know him more in his challenges and his weaknesses and his vulnerabilities. But yet again, through all of that, his tenacity and his brutality and his need to be of service and, and get the job done. I said this earlier today, it's like he could be run over by a truck, but if there's one bone unbroken, he's gonna keep coming back. He's never gonna stop. That serves me well. I take a lot out of that for me in my life because I've been through a lot coming into this movie. I felt like I was kind of in Mike's shoes, which funnily enough, made the performance 
10 times more difficult, but 10 times more easy in other ways because I was where he was. I think that not only am I getting to know him, I seem to be becoming him. <laughs>